Um, so I'll be talking about the nephron cardioprotective effects of STLT2 inhibitors, which, are, which is a new kid on the block, relatively new kid. Okay. Just a few highlights from the uh, IDF Atlas. Uh, we currently have more than 10, uh, 10 million more adults with diabetes than in 2015. We have 34 million more adults who are at risk of developing diabetes than in 2015. 8 million more adults above the age of 65 with diabetes than 2015. I think 65, that should comprise half of you. Yeah? We have 54 billion US dollars which is spent more on diabetes than in 2015. And 19 million more adults with diabetes are undiagnosed than in 2015. So if you look at all of this, I'm, it has actually been declared to be a global emergency diabetes. Now, what we're going to see is that by, the, by 2045, we'll have a significant rise in the number of people who are going to be living with diabetes. And the biggest rise is going to come in Africa. We're going to have a 156% increase in people living with diabetes and its inherent complications. Okay? So, what is the relationship between diabetes and cardiovascular risk? Because this is where the whole uh, crux of the matter is. So diabetes is associated with a threefold increased risk of acute coronary syndrome. It is also associated with occurrence of acute coronary events 15 years earlier than somebody without diabetes. It has a twofold increased short and long-term mortality of sudden cardiac death as well, and an increased incidence of post-infarction, recurrent ischemic events, heart failure, and cardiogenic shock as well. So these are all of the associated cardiovascular risks that diabetes has. Now, despite improvements in our glycemic controls with our new, I mean, with, with all the drugs that we have, mortality still remains high in our patients with type 2 diabetes. And the life expectancy is significantly reduced. So somebody who has got diabetes has got a six-year lower life expectancy as compared to somebody with no diabetes. And somebody with diabetes who has had either a myocardial infarction or stroke has got a 12-year reduction in the life expectancy. Diabetes doubles the risk of, of vascular events, both coronary artery disease and cerebrovascular disease, as well as other vascular deaths as well. Okay. It is the leading cause of cardiovascular disease, kidney failure, blindness, and lower limb amputations. Approximately 50 to 80% of people with diabetes die of cardiovascular disease. Almost half of the new kidney failure cases are observed in patients with diabetes. Most of our dialysis units, three quarters of them actually are with patients who have got diabetes and diabetic kidney disease or diabetic nephropathies. Almost two thirds of the non-traumatic lower limb amputations occur in diabetic, in diabetic patients more than 20 years of age, which uh, poses a significant morbidity as well. Approximately 16% of people aged more than 65 years with diabetes die of stroke, and almost a third of uh, people with diabetes who are more than 40 years have diabetic retinopathy. So there, there exists a significant unmet need to reduce complications of diabetes. Now, another very important thing is people with type 2 diabetes are at increased risk of heart failure. They were two to three fold higher risk of developing heart failure, and diabetes confers a 60 to 80 percent greater probability of all cause mortality and cardiovascular death in those with established heart failure. We look at diabetes and heart failure. Diabetes actually increases heart failure independent of coronary artery disease and independent of hypertension. And it actually causes what is called as diabetic cardiomyopathy, okay, which is defined as ventricular dysfunction that occurs in diabetic, uh, diabetic patients independent of a recognized cause such as uh, coronary artery disease and systemic arterial hypertension. The Framingham study firmly established the epidemiological link between diabetes and heart failure. The risk was increased more than twofold in men and fivefold in women of developing heart failure in those with diabetes. And it was basically independent of coexisting hypertension or coronary artery disease. So this basically tells us that patients with diabetes are at a higher risk of developing heart failure independent of coronary artery disease and hypertension as was previously thought. There has been a significant mortality improvement seen in, the, in major cardiovascular disease and atherosclerosis in patients with diabetes except in heart failure or arrhythmia. So this, this slide did not come up well, but this is what it showed. Okay. Now, a multifactorial approach is needed to, to tackle cardiovascular disease, as was evidenced by the Steno2 trial, which showed that 7.8 years of intensive therapy, which included targeting an HbA1c of less than 6.5%, a total cholesterol of less than 4.5 millimoles, a triglyceride of less than 1.7, controlling your blood pressures, 
and asking the patients to, so, to stop smoking, it basically reduced all-cause death and mortality significantly as compared to conventional therapy, which was statistically significant. And at, 20, and at 21 years follow-up, there was a 7.9 years of gain of life. So basically this tells us that diabetes is, I mean, it's not only uh, managing the glucose, there are multiple other issues that we need to manage for patients with diabetes. So how about kidney disease and diabetes? Patients with diabetes are at a high risk of kidney disease. It remains the most common reason for progression to end-stage kidney disease in many parts of the world, including ours here as well. As I said, most of our dialysis units are with patients who have got diabetes. And diabetic kidney disease is a strong predictor of mortality in patients with diabetes. So diabetic kidney disease occurs as a consequence of multiple pathogenic pathways, which I'm sure all of us know, in the, in the diabetic kidney. So when it comes to selecting the drugs for our diabetic patients, there are four key questions that we need to ask. One is that what is a patient-specific HbA1c target, okay? Number two, we need to take into account our patient comorbidities and our patient characteristics as well. And then, number three, which priorities are we looking at? Are we looking at cardiovascular disease risk protection? Are we looking at renal protective effects? Are we looking at weight loss? Are we looking at uh, reduction in, I mean, uh, reducing the events of hypoglycemia? Which is the most cost-effective drug? Yeah? And how durable is it for the patient to continue with that medication? And then the fourth point is, which drug class has the best evidence for safety and long-term efficacy? Remember that the new kids on the block, the SGLT2 inhibitors, had this um, safety concern of increased fractures, increased risk of amputations, increased risk of UTIs as well, which I'm going to uh, talk about in the trials. So these are the things that you have to consider for the patients who are diabetic and who come to you in terms of when to, uh, drug selection for them. This is what also the ADA and the uh, European Association of the Study of Diabetes consensus in 2018 said as well. We're supposed to take into account the drugs that basically reduce atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk and mortality, reduce the risk of heart failure and chronic kidney disease, the drugs that minimize hypoglycemia, and the drugs that are cost effective because cost is a major issue, especially in sub-Saharan Africa where we live. So, since the talk is on SGLT2 inhibitors, this is what we'll focus on. SGLT2 basically stands for sodium glucose co-transporters, and the two uh, co-transporters, we have the SGLT1 and the SGLT2. SGLT1 is mostly found in the intestine with some being found in the kidney. SGLT2 is almost exclusively found in the kidney. Uh, in terms of sugar specificity, SGLT2, I mean, SGLT2 is very uh, specific for glucose while SGLT1 is specific for both glucose and galactose. The affinity of glucose is higher for SGLT1 and slightly lower for SGLT2. The capacity for glucose transport is much higher for SGLT2 as compared to SGLT1, okay? And its role is mainly for renal glucose reabsorption for SGLT2, and for SGLT1 is for both dietary glucose absorption and re uh, renal glucose absorption. So normally we filter around 180 grams of glucose per day through the glomerulus, and within the uh, proximal convoluted tubule, where SGLT2 and SGLT1 is found, almost all of the glucose is reabsorbed within the SGLT2. 90% is reabsorbed by SGLT2, and approximately 10% is absorbed by SGLT1. Okay? Now, when it comes to diabetes, when the renal threshold is more than 11 millimoles, the capacity of the transporters is exceeded, and this actually results in, this is what results in urinary glucose excretion. Now, when you inhibit the SGLT2 inhibitors, it, it basically leads to increased urinary glucose excretion and osmotic diuresis. And this is how you basically lead to loss of your glucose. Now, this is a slide showing that mainly SGLT2 is, is found in the kidney, while SGLT1 is found in the kidney and other organs as well, uh, mainly in the uh, small intestine, but also in the heart, in the muscles, and in the colon as well. Okay. These are the three drugs that are available here. We have the empagliflozin, dapagliflozin, and canagliflozin. These are the characteristics and the pharmacological properties. The dose for empagliflozin is 10 to 25 milligrams. We start off with 10 milligrams. For dapa is 5 to 10, and for canagliflozin is 100 to 300 milligrams. All of these are given once daily. Uh, empa and dapa are given with or without food. Canagliflozin has to be given before the first meal of the day. They are the peak plasma concentrations. Now, when it comes to elimination, most of it is basically hepatic, 
apart from uh, yeah sorry uh, most of it is renal apart from canagliflozin which is hepatic now what about the clinical data for stlt2 inhibitors when it comes to cardiovascular disease and renal disease so among the first trials that basically looked at cardiovascular disease was the mpareg outcome trial and this was looking at uh, it was a randomized double blinded placebo controlled trial to assess the effect of once daily empagliflozin either 10 mg or 25 mg versus placebo on cardiovascular events in adults with type 2 diabetes who are at very high risk of cardiovascular risk against a background of standard care. And this was a multi center trial. There were 42 countries that were involved, and there were 590 sites that were selected within these countries. Okay? So they screened more than 11,000 patients and subsequently randomized more than 7,000 patients. As I said, there were three arms. There was a placebo arm, the MPA 10 milligram, and the MPA 25 milligrams. Okay? And the trial was to continue until at least 691 patients uh, experienced an adjudicated primary outcome event. So this was the inclusion criteria. All adults with type 2 diabetes with a BMI of less than 45, HbA1c of between 7 to 10 percent, and who had established cardiovascular disease. So these are patients who either had a prior myocardial infarction, who had a, had a uh, coronary artery disease, stroke, unstable angina, or peripheral arterial disease. And the key exclusion criteria, of course, was an EGFR of less than 30. Remember that these drugs have to be filtered in the kidney for them to work. So this is why it's important to, to, to get to EGFR. These are the uh, pre-specified primary and key secondary outcomes. So the primary outcome was a three-point major adverse cardiovascular event, or the three-point MACE, which was time to first occurrence of a cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI or non-fatal stroke. And the key secondary outcome was a three-point MACE from the primary outcome with hospitalization for unstable angina. So these are the further pre-specified outcomes, which are the cardiovascular death, the non-fatal MIs, non-fatal strokes, hospitalization for heart failure, and all-cause mortality. <coughs> so when you look at the cardiovascular events, empagliflozin significantly reduced the three-point mace as compared to placebo, which was statistically significant. There was a reduction in the three-point mace, but if you look at the individual ones, it was only the cardiovascular death, which was statistically significant, okay, as compared to the other two. So cardiovascular death, there was a significant reduction in your cardiovascular death in the, in the empagliflozin arm. That's both the 10 milligrams and the 25 milligrams as compared to placebo. And there was also a, a, a significant reduction in hospitalization for heart failure, although that was not a primary uh, uh, endpoint as well. All-cause mortality was significantly reduced as well in the empagliflozin arm as compared to the placebo arm. Now, so the... When you look at the summary for the cardiovascular events, there was a 14% reduction in the three-point mace. There was a 38%, which is quite a significant reduction in your cardiovascular death, a 32% reduction in all-cause mortality, and a 35% reduction in heart failure hospitalizations. And when they look at the overall safety profile, they found that it was consistent with the previous clinical trials. The only thing that was there was that it had a slightly increased risk of UTIs, but the other things that people are afraid of, like BKA, amputations, fractures, were similar in the placebo arm as well. Now, when they looked at progression of, di of kidney disease in type 2 diabetes in the Empire Egg outcome trial, now remember that this was not one of the primary outcomes, this was one of the secondary pre specified outcomes as well. So, you can't make any uh, strong conclusions from this, you can only infer for a, uh, for a hypothesis generation. So, there was a significant reduction in your new onset or worsening nephropathy with the MPA arm as compared to the placebo arm, okay? The new onset of macroalbuminuria, for, for those patients who had established microalbuminuria, the risk of progression to macroalbuminuria was significantly reduced in the MPA cliflozin arm as compared to the placebo arm. The doubling of serum creatinine was also significantly reduced in the MPA cliflozin arm versus the placebo arm. <coughs> And the time to first initiation of continuous renal replacement therapy was also significantly reduced as well. New onset or worsening nephropathy in patients with prevalent kidney disease was also significantly reduced in the empagliflozin arm. So the only thing that they found that was not statistically significant was the new onset of microalbuminuria. So somebody who did not have, who had normal albuminuria, empagliflozin did not prevent them from getting microalbuminuria, but it did reduce the risk of developing macroalbuminuria. Then came the CANVAS program, which was basically the canagliflozin, looking at uh, reduction in your cardiovascular events. 
Now the CANVAS program basically involved uh, two trials. There was a CANVAS trial and the CANVAS R trial, which was a CANVAS renal trial, and included both of these patients in the, for the final analysis of the CANVAS program. And this was basically looking at canagliflozin 300 milligrams or 100 milligrams versus placebo. And what they found was that uh, there was a significant reduction in the three-point mace, which was a cardiovascular death, non-fatal myocardial infarction, or non-fatal stroke. So this is a summary for the CANVAS program. You can see that mainly this, the hospitalization for heart failure was, was significantly reduced and cardiovascular death. And the primary uh, three-point mace was also significantly reduced as well. Now, the declared TME58 basically was a huge multicenter trial looking at more than 17,000 patients. And it basically looked at two groups of patients, those with already with established cardiovascular disease and those with high risk cardiovascular disease. And these were the safety, I mean, they looked at two endpoints. There was a primary safety endpoint, which was a composite of cardiovascular death, non-fatal or uh, MI or non-fatal ischemic stroke, and efficacy endpoints, which was MACE and a composition of hospitalization for heart failure. And these are the characteristics for the cardiovascular disease, established cardiovascular risk, and those with the highest uh, cardiovascular disease risk. And what it found was that it, it was basically non-inferior to placebo when it, when it came to the uh, composite endpoints, the three-point mace. However, for the hospitalization for heart failure, there was a statistically significant reduction in those patients with, on the DAPA arm versus the placebo arm. And even in the renal composite arm as well, there was a significant reduction in the DAPA arm. Then came the canagliflozin and renal outcomes in type 2 diabetes, the CREDENCE trial, which was specifically looking at type 2 diabetic patients with uh, nephropathy now. Okay? So it was a double-blinded randomized trial, and it in included all patients with type 2 di diabetes with albuminuric CKD, and the patients had to have an EGFR of more than 30. And they were given canagliflozin at a dose of 100 milligrams per day versus placebo. And the primary outcome was a composite of end-stage kidney disease, doubling of your serum creatinine and death from renal or cardiovascular causes. Now the trial was stopped early after they had uh, a median follow-up of 2.62 years because they actually achieved their uh, pre-specified endpoints. And the relative risk of the primary outcome was 30% lower in the canagliflozin group than in the placebo group. And of note is that there was no significant difference in the rates of amputation or fractures between the placebo group and the canagliflozin group because this is what people are afraid of. In the, when they were using canagliflozin as per the other trials. This one has just been released in the New England Journal of Medicine. I think it was, it was published uh, yesterday, but it was presented at the European Society of Cardiology in, on 1st of September. This was the DAPA heart failure trial, which was looking at DAPA gliflozin in patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction. It basically was a follow-up of the declared TME58, which showed that DAPA, was, uh, DAPA gliflozin was shown to reduce the risk of hospitalization for heart failure compared with placebo. So they took more than 4,700 patients, uh, more than 18 years of age. Now this one was significant, uh, uh, of significant importance because they included patients with or without type 2 diabetes. So even the patients without type 2 diabetes who had heart failure were also included in this, in this uh, study as well. And these patients are supposed to have heart failure, I mean, uh, with reduced ejection fraction. So an EF of less than 40% within the last 12 months. And the primary endpoint was time to first occurrence of any of the components of cardiovascular death or hospitalization of heart failure or an urgent heart failure visit. And what they found was that there was a significant reduction, a 26% relative risk reduction in the primary endpoint with the DAPA arm as compared to the placebo arm. Again, worsening heart failure events was significantly low in the DAPA arm as compared to the placebo arm. And the cardiovascular death was also 18% lower in the DAPA arm as compared to the placebo arm. So looking at all of these trials, we know that uh, the STLT2 inhibitors actually, apart from their lowering the glucose uh, lowering effects, they also have uh, effects on the, uh, independent of that on uh, cardiovascular and renal outcomes. And what is postulated is that it actually reduces your albuminuria. It reduces your blood pressures, of course, because of the volume status of the patient. It has... Uh, effects on reducing your arterial stiffness, reducing your sympathetic nervous system activity. It has been shown to significantly reduce your weight and adipose, uh, uh, visceral adiposity, sorry, and also reduces oxidative stress. So SGLT2 inhibitors have significant reductions in your cardiovascular risk. They are renoprotective. They reduce your heart failure progression. 
and they have durable glucose lowering at all stages of disease. And they can be combined with a wide range of oral glucose lowering drugs and insulin. They lead to weight loss, blood pressure lowering, and they have a very low risk of hypoglycemia as well. So in summary, diabetes has been shown to be a significant risk factor for cardiovascular and kidney disease. Multifactorial intervention has been shown, as was shown in the standard two, is key to long-term uh, cardiovascular risk reduction. The choice of therapy can now be tailored in patients with type 2 diabetes with a significant cardiovascular risk to improve clinical outcomes and reductions in albuminuria and renal decline. SGLT2 inhibitors are efficacious and beneficial add-ons to therapy as a uh, therapy choice to metformin and various insulin regimens with a good safety profile. And correct patient profiling is key to ensure patients derive maximum benefits of this drug class. Thank you. <laughs>